Okay. Um, I, I like languages. I like punning. Uh, I, I have to say uh, there's a third meaning of to be or not to be, and it's cross-cultural, uh, and it has nothing to do with gender, and it has to do with how much coffee you drink. <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, Ian, you, you never told us what the name of the chair of your department is. Who is it? Before I judge bench. So, uh, I want to very quickly for about three minutes on, on each paper, I have to say, first of all, the discussion of English departments in Canada. Uh, Ian, uh, you, on one hand, it seems to me that um, the fact that all of your streams are, or all of the concentrations, of English language, linguistics, drama, uh, literature, and so on, combined in one department, you might be right uh, that it's unique in Canada. Uh, and I, I wonder about um, the, the programmatic effect of just that kind of combination. So, uh, on one hand, uh, I have to say that I thought I, I was intrigued. I was intrigued by it because it seems to me that there's a there's a real opportunity for an integrated approach to language and literature. Great. And then all of my experience of English departments in Canada, I have to say, including the departments that I reviewed, the department that I've chaired, blah blah blah, is that there is always, there is, I've always found the tension between the teaching of English as a second language, the teaching of literature, the teaching of composition, or as it's called, uh, theater and so on and so forth, and the, the general history of English departments in Canada is the opposite, I think I agree with you, of what you described, and it is that those departments that began as integrated units calved off in various ways and split off. University of Winnipeg, for example, the theater department split off, Teaching composition, as it was called, uh, wrongly split off. Uh, the teaching of uh, film and, and uh, video split off into film studies and so on and so forth. So I was intrigued by that. Uh, I, I, one other comment, though, uh, I have to say, the fact I was intrigued, this is why I wanted to know the name of your chair. Because uh, on one hand, it seems to me that what you described is a kind of an attempt at an integrated model of teaching language and literature, and at the same time, I wonder if there are those in your department who don't think that there's a relentless historicizing of the whole project. I just wonder, I, I just ask you the question, I don't know what the answer is, yes or not, and the fact that, that you have a chair who thinks that way is wonderful. Uh, uh, but I, I, on, and then I wondered about your students, because you, your closing comment was, that uh, your chair, I take it, was in despair at the student who asked about them teaching things that happened before he was born, that, that particular student. So in, in other words, on one hand, you have a project, I think, that potentially teaches language and literature in an integrated way. And on the other hand, you have a project which your students, I'm not sure, particularly that student, it seems to me, would have been lost on him or her, I don't know. Uh, but that the students uh, might have problems engaging with. I don't know, you know it's just, just a question. On the two Brazilian papers, I, I, want, to, uh, I want to talk about them. Uh, I want to make some observations about both of them together and then apart. It, it sounds to me, uh, uh, particularly with Luis Roberto, it's, it sounds to me as if there is, uh, well, my general comment is that in Brazil, unlike in Canada, there is almost a relentless bureaucratizing of education, by which I mean both of you talked about the official governmental documents which superintend the ways in which things should be in the classroom. Although I gather that your experience in the classroom, uh, Valkyria talked about what happens when people close the door, is something quite different. But what I, what I, what I found uh, in, in both presentations, less explicit in yours, more explicit in Pozani's was, is that the documents say something about the theory of teaching, curricular design, uh, they, they import theory of all kinds in the making of meaning and so on and so forth. So they are quite explicit in what they think should happen in the classroom and what you as a professor teaching teachers should do on one hand. And on the other hand, your experience of trying to implement that curriculum and perhaps the teacher's experience as they carry that curriculum forward is something quite <coughs> different. So I, I, what I found was at the end of your presentation, I think that you're quite aware of that. That to me is fascinating because in Canada, I would say, so though the Canadians in the room might agree with me, there is far less 
bureaucratizing at the governmental level of curricular design, curricular reform. There's certain, you know, I would be very happy if a minister uh, or a deputy minister of education knew the name Bakhtin. <laughs> Back in, in Canada, uh, uh, so there there is much more of a division between the uh, those in charge of or supervising or superintending. So, minister of education, assistant deputy ministers, in some cases, presidents of universities, etc., uh, etc. Et there is less theory informing their practice uh, and more alleged autonomy in the classroom for professors and for teachers of education and so on and so forth. So that that. Uh, Intrigued me. The, the the question that I would have for you, though, is 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 this. On one hand, there is all of it, so it looks to me like the documents that you described, the documents. Uh, let's talk about the, the 2006 documents, the revised documents that you described. It sounds to me like they are, on their surface, um, very aware of uh, structuralism, post-structuralism, discourse theory. Bakhtin, Echo, uh, Iser, reader response, and so on, all, all things that would be familiar to us in this room, but in, from a Canadian point of view, would be less familiar to those who are designing curriculum or who are uh, at the higher levels of administration. So on the surface, it looks to me like uh, those documents are uh, perfectly fine, I guess you would say. My question is, why do you think or, the more general, I'm intrigued by the fact that on one hand, the documents seem to be so theoretically informed, and on the other hand, the practice uh, in the classroom should be either stilted or impractical or in, in one way or another not following those prescriptions because they sound to me very much like prescriptions. And I, I have to say that I, I think that many of those theorists would be horrified, appalled, scandalized, offended at their at the use to which their theory is being I'm, I'm reminded of a line from, from Auden, the words of the dead are modified in the guts of the living. Anyway, that's just a, a comment. And then well, Zani, uh, um, in your uh, in your paper uh, uh, again I find when you describe the documents that govern practice, the, doc the official documents that govern the ways in which professors of education are supposed to carry out their discipline, uh, they are explicit to a degree that you, will, you would not find in Canada. I mean, you would not find the documents that the Department of Education uses to be as explicit, and but what I found was, and I think, I think I understood you to be saying the same thing, you are appalled at, for example, if you close with a poem, and the five, I guess they're multiple choices, are they multiple choice responses? Yes. So, so there, again, there seems to be a great divide between the prescribed uh, intentions of those who design curriculum and the ways in which Somebody imagines those things being implemented in the classroom. Somebody is imagining that reading that poem and making meaning in those ways is going to lead students to be educated, global, culturally aware citizens. And yet, what you have is, and, and uh, I think I heard you say that you're, you're not encouraged or perhaps allowed to express any opinion about any, any opinion about a literary text. Is that correct? But so my, I was one minute. I was I was I was uh, perplexed by how that could be. How is it? I would. I'm not asking. You, I'm, I'm, it's a rhetorical question. How is it that a designer of curriculum could be so theoretically aware as to invoke Bakhtin, Iser, Bart, De Saussure, whomever, and then also prescribe that that you cannot have an opinion about that which you are uh, discussing, forget teaching, discussing in the classroom. How could that be? There's, there's just, there's just a, a tremendous disconnect, it seems to me, which, which um, perplexes me. I, 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 it's not foreign to me, but it perplexes It's not foreign to me in Canada either. I, so don't think that I'm, 
that I'm pointing a finger at Brazilians. I'm saying that uh, the uses to which theory are put are uh, often contradictory, um, uh, if not subverting the very theory that they portend to be um, supporting. So the reader response theory, for example, make the making of meaning for another. If you're really engaged in making meaning in the classroom and you're encouraging your students to make meaning as well, how could it possibly be that you could not have an opinion about a text, literary or otherwise? I can't see. I can't. I, I, I know it's, it's a rhetorical question. I, I just can't see how that would operate. Last, last comment. In operational terms, it, it, it almost looks to me as if um, I don't, I don't mean to be offensive. It almost looks to me as if Brazilian teachers, or those who teach Brazilian teachers, are, are necessarily involved in a subversive activity without, without a reason for that to, it, it's not necessary, but given the context, it almost seems as if that's what you must do, which seems odd to me. I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. I'll, I'll close with that, I, I'm, I'm probably wrong. No, no, this is the point of the national project.